Now a story that kind of surprised me and then I thought about it and it doesn't. We all know that for the last two or three years, the state of our health system and stopping its collapse has led us to take some remarkable measures in this country. And also that our inability or the difficulties we've had recruiting nurses and healthcare professionals has led to some policy changes just in the last week in terms of immigration setting. And whilst we might think of healthcare workers as primarily being involved in the job of saving lives, there are also a group of professionals and organisations who assist people who need or inevitably let go of lives, and they are the people and generally, I think, charitable trusts around the country that run hospices. Um, so I was intrigued and slightly puzzled by a story uh, I saw in the paper this week in Wellington about Mary Potter Hospice. Um, and I got to say, it's a place, um, you know, where my loved ones, my dad passed away in the hospice. The Mary Potter Hospice is having issues with capacity. And I really want to delve more deeply into that. So we are joined now by Tony Payne. Tony is the uh, Chief Executive of Mary Potter Hospice. Uh, Tony, uh, season's greetings to you. Thank you for joining us on the platform. Morning, Sean. Thanks, Luke. All right. What is the issue that you guys are facing? Well, the, the simplest way of putting it is, is there are teams of doctors and nurses and social workers and so forth who we have working in the community, supporting people who are nearing the end of their life in their own homes uh, uh, past capacity. Um, we simply are really struggling to meet demand. Um, and there's, there's two reasons for that. The first one is that this is, a, as you say, this is a symptom of the entire health system coming out of two years of the borders being closed, of COVID, um, of workforce shortages. And so we are being increasingly asked to pick up things that other parts of the health system used to do, yep. which they're not doing anymore. So yep. we're seeing district nursing services struggling to meet demand. We're seeing people who come and provide care and support for people in their own homes with things like personal care, struggling to get staff to do that. And so all of that's put more pressure on our services. It takes, a, you know, palliative care takes time in any case for obvious reasons. Um, we have to wrap a lot of services around people and their families. And that just means that we, the, the, the demand coming coming to us um, is greater than what we can meet with our with our present resources. Okay, so but I'm just trying to figure out: are people more people needing hospice care, or your capacity has shrunk? No, it's it's uh, the people who are needing hospice care need more time, and are, are, are becoming more complex because they're coming to us later in their journey towards death, which is another symptom of their passage through a, through a health system which which is full of waiting lists and right. And, I get and you. Um, and and also because um, we're being asked, to, we're being expected to do more um, with with things like that would otherwise be done by other parts of the health system, um, compounded by our lack of our own lack of resources. And the hospice sector has been um, unsustainably funded for for decades. And and as you as you know here in, in Wellington, we we enjoy a huge amount of support from the community, but that's an unsustainable way, way to run a an essential health service. So we only get fifty percent of what it needs to run the hospice from the government, and the rest you look for the last years from the from from the community. Um, so, kind what is your what are the current settings for the hospice, and what have you got special settings over the holiday break or, or, or what? Yeah, so we for the, for the at, at the moment we're saying we're only taking urgent referrals, um, and that that means that uh, if someone has is in the last year of their life. Um, and has uh, moderate or severe physical symptoms that need addressing by our medical teams or uh, severe psychosocial symptoms in terms of the emotional impact or the, you know, the, the psychological impact of reaching the end of their lives or in their family situation, um, we are, uh, they are coming into the service. Um, that's, that's proving to be manageable for us, but there are people who we might otherwise have seen who are further away from death or are not, not so urgent in terms of where they're at on their, in their journey who are going to miss out on our services for the next few weeks uh, where we try to uh, continue our efforts to recruit. We've got, we're carrying a number of vacancies, um, proving very difficult to find people to fill them, um, and also trying to create a slightly more flexible approach to our workforce and to get us through this, this time of the year where, of course, we've yeah. got people going on. You must have been heartened by the, you know, the green light for a path to residency for, for nurses. Yeah, yeah, you could you could argue that that should have happened a long time ago, but yeah. um, that we've got we're current. I mean, we're currently 
um, interviewing people from overseas, something like 40% of the health workforce in New Zealand has an overseas qualification. So that tells you how important um, people coming from overseas to keep our health system running is. Um, and that's true in the whole health sector as well as in the, in the hospice sector. Yeah. Is what's happening at Mary Potter and Wellington reflected in other hospices around the country? Is this a, a common yeah, problem? It, it, yeah, we, there are a number of hospices um, up and down the country, which, as you say, are all run by charitable trusts who are uh, restricting their services. Um, and every hospice I know, every CI I talk to, uh, they're running significant deficits. So they're, they're having to use reserves uh, just to keep the lights on, which is really unacceptable for what, what is in this, you know, palliative care is an essential yeah. part of the health system. And I think everyone would agree that, that as people reach the end of their lives with a life-limiting lim- illness, um, they need and deserve the best medical support we can give them. Yeah. Um, gosh, you guys have been through a bit, and, and the idea of death, and it's, you know, as I know it's a taboo subject that we don't like to talk about. Has the end of life, um, and it's not a cynical question, it's a serious question, has the end of life choice legislation relieved any pressure on you? Are perceptions about death a- 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 and palliative care improving or not? Um... It hasn't relieved any pressure. In, any, in many ways, it's created additional pressure because generally the, the palliative care sector and the hospice sector's um, position on, on assisted dying is that's something that, that is not part of palliative care. And palliative care is something which where we say we, we don't want to prolong life unnecessarily and we don't want to shorten life unnecessarily. So 95% of the hospices in New Zealand say we will continue to support patients who make that choice. Yeah. Um, but we will stand aside as that process happens because it's not something we want to be part of. It's it's provided our workforce with the same set of dilemmas that, that the rest of the health workforce is fam- face, mm-hmm. facing and I guess the rest of the country because you know people support it, people don't support it. Um, and it, so it's just in a sense it's just added another layer of complexity to our ability to you know palliative care is all about helping a patient figure out what's important to them in their last short short weeks and months of their lives yeah. and, 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 and work, work those things through and if that's part of their choice, that in a sense that makes it just a bit more complicated. Mm-hmm. Bearing in mind that still we're one year in and, and, and there's only been a few hundred people who've, who've taken that option in the last, last couple of months. Yeah, yep, I, 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 I hear you, Tony. Tony, when do you think or when do you hope um, that things will get back to being as difficult as they were normally? If you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great way of putting it. Look, I think, you know, I think when the history of the pandemic is written, we won't come to fully understand the, the impact on our society on a whole lot of levels um, and how long they're going to last for um, until we're sort of a, a few more years ahead. I think we'll, we'll continue to see shortages in the, in the health workforce for a number of years. You can't just, you can't just, we're not growing enough doctors and nurses and, and allied health professionals in New Zealand. For, um, we haven't done good investment in our, in our workforce development infrastructure. Um, I was thinking the other day when my GP retired, um, did no one figure out that about this time something like 60% of GPs are over, over 55? Yeah. And that they were, you know, couldn't we have done something about that 10 years ago? In hindsight's a wonderful thing. So I think it's going to take a while. Um, but I do think we're having some encouraging conversations with the reformed health system who are, I think, are, I think are heading in the right direction in terms of thinking about, for example, sustainable funding for palliative care. Yeah. Look, um, I think the work you guys do is amazing um, um, and it's not something you like to think about. I, I hope you guys get through the break all right um, and I wish you well for the future, Tony. I thank you very much indeed for joining us this morning. Uh, thanks a lot, Sean. You're very welcome. Cheers. Tony Payne there, the CEO uh, at Mad Mary Potter Hospice. Yeah, they're health professionals because they administer drugs and they help it. Oh, they help people travel that journey and they help families uh, travel that journey. Uh, Good folk too at Mary Potter Hospice, I must say.